Hello and welcome to Accelerating Impact, where we explore the rapidly evolving world of artificial intelligence. Join us as we unpack the potential for AI technologies to transform our ways of working and magnify our mark, whether as individuals, companies, or society at large. For both seasoned experts and curious minds alike, this podcast is your guide to understanding the cutting edge developments that are shaping our future. My name is Zhu Koja, a technology executive focused on architecture and innovation, and this is Accelerating Impact, brought to you by Nielsen IQ, the world's leading global consumer intelligence company. Our guest today is Mark Flynn. He serves as the SVP of product for NIQ Basis, where he and his team focus on the ways that AI can transform consumer survey-based analytics. Mark, thank you for joining us. I've been really looking forward to this conversation because I know you guys are doing some really cool things. Uh, first and foremost, can you tell me what is Basis? I think the easiest and fastest way to think of Basis or understand Basis is through the eye or the lens of of innovation. So I think we all know what innovation is. Like if you're creating a new product um, or renovating an existing product that's in market, um, and there are tons of reasons why this need might come about, manufacturers and retailers understandably have a ton of questions. I won't list them out, you know. Where should I innovate is a big one. Where are the largest opportunities? What's the size of those opportunities? Are my ideas even good? What's the revenue potential? I could list them all out. So basically everything you need to succeed um, when it comes to innovation is, is what Basis does. So I mean, how do you guys typically do this sort of thing? How do you, how do you make these assessments? So it is survey-based market research. We go out and we talk with real consumers, people that are making purchases every single day. Um, but what makes our approach different is our historic databases. So we've been testing innovations for so long. And with NIQ data, we have been able to track innovation performance and calibrate our models so that when we do these consumer tests, it's not just subjective responses that we need to interpret. We can directly compare them to, to databases that are calibrated to in-market performance to predict uh, success. All right. So, Mark. You know, tell me a little bit more about how some of the advancements that we're seeing with all this generative AI sort of, you know, hoopla, how is that changing the way that Basies is is working with their clients? No doubt it's having a, a pretty big effect. One of the, it's called generative AI for a reason, okay? So this, this AI has the incredible ability to, on request, um, generate new content. And our clients, who are big CPG manufacturers and small CPG manufacturers alike are using these tools increasingly to ideate, okay? Even if you are developing their own bespoke ideation tools, right, that are, you know, leveraging some of their own historic data, but anyone can just log into uh, any of these large language models and you start ending up with the problem they didn't expect, right? Or, or one that only the biggest players um, expected, right? So Basis has long been a service provider for big CPG who has big waves of, of ideation across their multinational organization and helping them um, using traditional market research methods, um, pare that down, right? But they have big budgets and long timelines and that problem now exists for clients that want to be a lot more agile. They don't have these big chassis underneath them. They're oftentimes companies where the insights department is also the marketing department, is also the finance department, and they're using these tools. And now all of a sudden they have these, these uh, t tons of ideas, all of which they think have potential. So we need to change our tooling to fit for those different profile customers. And that's and that's why we're focusing on actually using generative AI to solve, well, in conjunction with NIQ data, to help solve for the problem that the generative AI is actually creating. I see. Okay. So have you guys seen a lot of change in your processes? We're starting to. I think generative AI and advancements in AI and, and computing power are, are pretty quickly pointing away from traditional market research as the future of market research. And there's lots of different areas that we're exploring um, to kind of take this industry and our business uh, to the next level, yeah. So, okay, make make this concrete for me. Typically, the process with Basies is to, uh, I'm assuming you guys find panelists and, and administer surveys and, and kind of 
uh, collect demographic information, like what what is now starting to reveal itself as a as a different way of of doing this this sort of thing. These technologies came out at first, and people got really excited, and they started doing things like, "Oh, can I use these AI models to to test things a lot faster?" and 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 or can I use this vast testing history that we, especially Basies, has to train yeah. a model, if you will, to predict success more of a closer into like a traditional machine learning application, but using generative AI. Um, and the answer is, lots of people are trying to do that. You see lots of folks out there developing. Um, you know, persona archetypes that are these monolithic versions of people that are, you know, individuals, but that supposedly represent many. Um, we're not going down any of those paths. We're taking a, a different approach. I already mentioned we're not training. We're not trying to predict things using machine learning techniques. We're prompting with real-time data, okay, meaning up-to-the-moment data, which gets past that uh, sort of the recency bias or the moment in time bias that exists with training. Um, and we're having these models impersonate individual households to provide outcomes just like that. Okay, so what stops uh, you know, a fly-by-night operation from simply going into chat GPT, uh, you know, trying their their hand at some of these micro impersonations as you've as you've termed it, right? They just go in and say, uh, you know, a 65, a pretend you're a 65 year old Asian female with household income of X, Y, Z and past purchase history of, of ABC. Uh, would you buy a brand new mouthwash with the following characteristics and just kind of doing that, you know, over and over and over and over again for different sorts of like demographic permutations, purchase history permutations? Like what prevents some some other organization from just trying their hand at this and saying yeah here you go this is these are the, the results the short answer is nothing nothing prevents them from trying to do it in fact you right now zoo could go in and do that very thing but you can't do it with the the data that we have and the way that we're volunteering it and i should mention it's worth noting i said basis has has been working on ways to calibrate stated responses for years and to adapt for biases that exist in panels. Synthetic panels are no different. Let me give you an example. Today, we go out and we do plenty of surveying in Japan. Um, Japan culturally is a more reserved culture. They're unlikely to say they're very likely to purchase something or not so likely. They live sort of in the middle of the scale. And we know that because we have the in-market data over decades to say, oh, well, you need to adjust this up to reflect reality and down to reflect, reflect reality um, versus, say, a country like Brazil, um, which tends to live on the, the ends of the scale, right? They're much more likely to use these things and saying, yeah, definitely would do that, definitely would not. Yeah, that's the whole prompt engineering skill, right? Like, I, I feel like we have a history of having done these surveys thousands of times on thousands of panels. We know what distribution curves look like, what response curves look like mm -hmm. amongst these panels. And if you just jump into ChatGPT and just start firing away different questions and trying to, to map those responses, they may not even resemble what a, what a response curve should look like. And you have to figure out precisely how to phrase things what order to phrase them in, because the input uh, has a massive impact on what the output yep. is from these models. And there was a uh, a manufacturer advisory board where you guys had uh, had shown them a slide of like human respondents versus AI respondents for purchase intent of a concept that you guys were. We're testing. I think it might have been like teeth whitening or a face wash. I don't know what the concept was, was but anyway, actually. it was yeah. mm -hmm. it was it was both. Okay, uh, and I and I feel like the the mic drop slide was you know fifty four percent of human respondents said that they were either very likely or somewhat likely to purchase this concept. Yeah. Oh, by the way, fifty five percent of AI respondents within one percent were either very likely or somewhat likely. Like, how yeah. 
Like, how did you guys nail that? It's the data that is the power. Okay? And I don't just mean our historic testing data here at Basies, but all of NIQ's data, because we have a tremendous m- amount of information on household consumption patterns. Um, and, and these unlock really exciting opportunities um, and allow us to, to leverage what is a, you know, you, I've talked with you about it before, a not so secret superpower of, of AI. And it's funny what you learn about, about these models. They can be extremely objective sometimes, uh, perhaps overly objective. And frankly, they can be too smart, right? Think about it. They've read more books, okay, than any other a human being that has ever taken a survey before. And sometimes to their detriment, they're way too smart. So we we were replaying a concept for a gum sensitivity toothpaste or someone who, who has reseeding gums or, or bad gum health. And the AI model was based on a real person, a, a female, I think in their early 40s. And the foundation model knew that gum health is and and the problems that stem from it are sort of endemic in that population. So when you compared the result of its purchase preference for this early 40s female in this given region, it overstated the the concern because it's read all the academic journals, the medical journals about how this this health problem is exploding. So it's just it's fascinating little nuggets like this that we need to work through and in our prompting mitigate some of them. And and a big one I should mention, Zoo, is the inclusion of NIQ data sources that aren't just demographic. We have a huge amount of data on product attributes. Toothpaste is a great example because close to everybody purchases toothpaste, and we know the characteristics of the brands of the, the, the toothpaste that they're buying. This is the, the the sort of learning library we're compiling right now. We're deep in the in the in the mix of experimenting in this realm right now. What's important to remember is what these tools are trained on, right? The training data set has things like, you know, all of the medical journals in the world, but it also has a lot of like activist content, right? If someone feels passionately about something, they tend to speak about it more. And that uh, biases these training data sets. And these tools think that, that it matters more for the general population. So we're working on, we're starting to make progress. We need to calibrate uh, both how we prompt, but also how we adjust responses um, to to make sure what we're getting is 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 accurate. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. You mentioned real time. Now, I I don't know if this is related or not, but you know, we we have these survey based exercises that we do, survey based analysis. But when you say real time, like what? Tell me more about what you mean there. So this data refreshes as frequently as NIQ refreshes it. And what we're doing is building an engine that spins up, for lack of a better term, each time a run is initiated by one of our customers from a pool of tens of thousands of potential households, the exact right sample. And you don't need to to sample 50,000 people to get a, a statistically predictive um, response, you probably only need 200 or 300, or depending on the task, 400. And we run these in real time. Got it. And then So this is like a real time ad hoc instantiation of a 300 person panel to test anything. There's no delay for any right. of this kind of spinning up of the panel or spinning up of like what, what sorts of questions to ask. It's all, you know, it's, it's ad hoc. Correct. It's 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 ad hoc, but it's meant to be yeah in a in a way that allows you to use it iteratively, right? You don't have to design a complex research plan and hope you get all the answers you need. You can start with the most basic question of what is the potential of this idea, and this tool is going to guide you to develop it. Because another thing that's really cool about these models, their ability to be critical is amazing. Just like we are critical of, of, of a new idea, but they're also really, really good at explaining their preferences in ways older attempts of this using machine learning could never do. So the result that we get is, is not only predictive, but it's full of really rich diagnostics that help teams learn and understand what worked and why and what didn't and why. How are clients responding? Are they do they do they get it? Is there some sort of like a AI fluency gap in our 
communication with with clients to actually get these ideas to resonate or is it is it fairly easy i think the most effective practitioners are going to be those who embrace you know not understanding how the transformer works or anything like that it's going to be those people who or attention weights or anything like that those don't matter for everyday use they're going to be those who embrace learning and experimentation and take hopefully what is easy in taking the the human approach to understanding the behaviors um, so that these tools can can elevate uh, them at their jobs um, and they get the most out of it for themselves and i think you're actually hosting a webinar as well right are you are you kind of focusing on all these same sort of topics like tell me a bit more about about this webinar that you're hosting yeah i'm excited it's centered around you know some of the stuff that i was talking about so first building your comfort level with ai and ultimately how to turn yourself into not just a more like efficient person at your job but working towards being that ai champion within your organization because it's going to make you better, more successful, or even more satisfied in your in your job if you if you champion these tools. And you guys are not just like catering to data scientists and technologists, right? Because I feel like uh, a lot of people they they see these this the the different webinars, they see the different lecture series, and they just think, oh, you know what? I'll never be able to get this. It's not it's not for me. It's for the people that are already kind of in the in the in crowd and I'm on the outs like it, it's is it is it no, catering I, to a broader audience absolutely and 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 I think that's why I feel comfortable hosting it um you know I'm not I'm someone who's trained in behavioral science right observe observing human beings their behaviors and trying to decipher them that's something I think that comes naturally to everybody I think it's the right approach or sort of the most the, the, the most broadly applicable approach to understanding and getting benefit from these tools. If you're thinking of Gen AI for all, um, that is the focus we want to take. And and taking it more from a behavioral science angle, we'll touch upon the basics of how it works. But it, it's more so about again uh, leveling the playing field and making people feel empowered to step up and use these technologies without without fear or anxiety. It's good to know that we'll be hearing more more from you on on this topic. You know, with that, Mark, thank you so much. Uh, for joining us on the podcast today. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. I always love talking about some of the, the cool things that you guys are doing. Likewise, always great to talk to you, Zoo. I appreciate the time. Thank you as well to all of our listeners for tuning in and be on the lookout for the next episode of Accelerating Impact.